everyone, I'm John Evans, and welcome to another episode of One on One. Let's start with a full disclosure. I've known this week's guest for more than 30 years. Dr. Damian Brzezinski and I were college classmates. After graduation, I went on to work in journalism. Damian went on to study music and medicine at two of the most prestigious schools in the country. Over the next three plus decades, Damien has used both of those talents to save a lot of lives. And Damien's newest venture has him traveling all across the country and rubbing elbows with some of the biggest names in music. Dr. Damien Brzezinski, musician Damien Brzezinski, college classmate Damien Brzezinski, yeah, sure. welcome to the One on One with John Evans podcast. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you. What do you like being better, a doctor or a musician? Um, dad and husband first. Always. Okay. So dad and husband are, are a slam dunk and that one's easier. Um, I've been a musician longer than I've been a doctor, as you recall. Um, and so I've been a musician most of my life. Uh, started actually in kindergarten with my best friend, Tony DeMito, who then became my roommate at Berkeley Music School, who I am leaving shortly for, um, uh, his wedding in Arizona. Wow. So I am actually attending my kindergarten best friend's um, wedding, uh, first wedding, okay, uh, he is our age, Good in Arizona. So uh, um, it's been because of friendships, it's be been because of love of music and medicine. And so, um, musician longer, um, medicine slightly shorter. Uh, I'd call them equal footing because I think the most important thing is having balance in life. And, and I've always noticed, I've always had music and medicine in my life um, since I've been in, ad in my adult life. Um, and every time that one is more than the other. I always feel like things are a little out of kilter. So it's important to have that life balance, and that's really what I strive for. Yeah, you have, you've put medicine ahead for a while and then picked, me, uh, picked music back up again recently in the last, I'd say, 10 to 15 years. Um, yeah, and music, obviously, as you know, has kind of a medicine twist. To right, it, so. in, in your life it has, yeah. Yeah, and, and it was one of those things where I had two very uh, different skill sets. And I did search for, for a decent while, trying to figure out how those skill sets fit together. And it was just by serendipity that they happened to kind of fall together in the career that I have now. And let's go uh, full disclosure here. Damien and I grew up in similar small towns in Pennsylvania, Nanticoke versus Nesquahoney. Uh, we are college classmates. We both graduated in 1984 from King's College in Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. And then we split for a while. You went to the Northeast, I went down South to do our careers. Uh, but when you were growing up in Natticoke, Pennsylvania, small coal mining town, just like my coal mining town, what did you want to do for a career? When did music come in? When did the thought of medicine come in? I just want to get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both. Yeah, you and me both. I just wanted to get out of that coal town, brother. And it didn't really matter how. Um, Music was my outlet back then. Um, I played in bands literally since grade school with, with friends who are grade school friends. And we, um, uh, we, we hacked away at our instruments and, and thought we were Led Zeppelin. And clearly we weren't. <laughs> but that was always my outlet and wanting to get out of that, that, that coal town. Um, uh, lovely coal town, which is still near and dear to me because it made me who I am. Um, and then medicine afforded me the opportunity out of that coal town. And then education came for both of us. Uh, I went north to Boston and uh, uh, trained at Harvard, um, picked up a matriculation at Berkeley Music School, and um, it all kind of rolled on from there, but it, uh, it was really that the music kept me sane uh, on the years that I was struggling to, to really find who I was and the years that I really wanted to find myself um, out of that coal town and, and someplace different. And our families are similar. You had three siblings. I had three siblings. Both of our fathers were World War II veterans. So we have an awful lot in common. But the family growing up, I know that's where you got your work ethic. I know that's where you got your love of family from because you've often talked about mom and dad. Yeah, we were, we were super tight as a family, just like you guys, you guys were. And um, dad was Air Force first, um, postal service after that. Uh, mom was a full-time mom. Uh, siblings were always tight. Um, our grandmother lived with us my entire life, um, uh, spoke very little English, Italian only. Um, and if you want to get fed, you spoke Italian. Yeah. Uh, mine was a Slovak growing up the same way. Perfect. And, and you're like, you obviously are like me. The one thing that you 
frustrate me growing up is when you would go to the grandparents' house and they would be having a conversation half in English. And then when they said something they didn't want you to hear, they would go over to, in my case, Slovak, in your case, Italian. And you're like, oh, I got to learn that language. Oh, I picked it up early. And unfortunately, I found that, that most of what my grandmother was saying was swear words. And, <laughs> and when I started repeating them, she actually just kind of kept it in English and yeah. just kept the, kept, the con- kept the private conversations private. And do you still see family fairly often? I know both mom and dad have passed, uh, but how about your siblings? Oh, yeah. And, and in fact, I'm headed back to Nanny Coca this weekend. And so, um, yeah, I see my siblings often. We keep in touch all the time. See my friends all the way far back as kindergarten. Uh, just, just retouched base with a bunch of my medical school friends yesterday in Baltimore where I was training. Um, and so family is super, super tight to me. And, uh, yeah, we have still have the house. Um, we had a uh, double block house in the coal mines of Pennsylvania. Uh, my grandmother originally purposed it uh, to be a boarding home for coal miners, and it was for years. Mm-hmm. And so technically, I can tell people that I was raised in a boarding home for coal miners. Um, uh, by the time I came around, many siblings later, because I was the youngest, um, a lot of that had gone away, and it was just a big old Italian family home. Um, so we're now renovating it, and we're looking to try to make it an Airbnb uh, near the ski resorts in Pennsylvania, um, but to keep the family tradition alive and to keep that, uh, to let that house, that house has gone through three generations, and uh, hopefully we we'll get it to that fourth generation in pretty good shape and go forward from there. And Nanakoka is just outside Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. For those of you who don't know, kind of a suburb, 20 minutes, I guess, or so, give or take, at least when I used to make that drive back and forth. Uh, but you do get the chance to go to King's College. What drove you to King's? I know, I think you got a scholarship there, did you not? I yeah. saw an old Times Leader newspaper article that you were one of four from John S. Fine High School in Nanako to get a scholarship. That is correct. So it was a full free ride, obviously, on a, uh, in a coal mining family. Um, there wasn't a lot of college money to go around. And uh, it wasn't an expectation that we got scholarships, but, um, you know, the schools that offered me full academic scholarships um, were obviously top of my list. And King's, uh, my brother was already there. Uh, My brother-in-law was class uh, president uh, many years prior to that. Um, So I knew the place. I was comfortable with the place. um, And I got a great education there. I really enjoyed my my years at King's um, have left me with a great education and lifetime friends like yourself. Yeah. And it's amazing when you finally came, well, I want to say finally, now that we've both been here for more than a quarter century, pretty much. Uh, But when you came back in town, because you went to Boston, you went to Baltimore, you went to Johns Hopkins, you literally went many places. And what eventually brought you to Wilmington? I know Wilmington Health Associates is where you first came here in town, right? Yeah, I mean, I've been thrown out of better places than this, so it worked out (laughs) great. Um, No, I, uh, so I went from um, Hopkins to Harvard to Duke, Uh, In between, I had a couple of stays at the University of London, uh, was in Milan for a bit, was in Perth, Australia, training, uh, learning, and um, came back. Um, When I got to Duke, um, really was the time to make that life decision of was I going to go the full academic research program? Um, Was I going to go kind of smaller town private practice? uh, Wilmington Health is and will always be wonderful to me, and um, my, my 20 plus years there were very well spent. Um, I'd driven down to visit a friend uh, who was part of Wilmington Health, and they had said, well, we really don't have a job offer now, um, but when we do, we'll call you. And so I kind of was heading back on I-40 um, with my car phone still installed in my car. Remember the days <laughs> yes, when you I had do. a car phone in the car? I do. And as I'm going north on I-40, the car phone rings, and uh, the, the chief of cardiology called me and said, remember when I told you we didn't have a job? Um, he said, well, one of our one of our people is dialing back, so you've got an opportunity. It happened to be the, the dear Linda Calhoun, who at that point was with child. She's a dear friend of ours. And the decision was made that they had room room for me. And I uh, uh, promptly got off, uh, I want to say, exit 56 and made the U-turn around to sign the contracts. Because, uh, frankly, I was driving north to Long Island to sign the contracts there to... to, uh, to really? Uh, yeah. So that's had, how the timing worked out. So you may not have been here after all. I was physically driving to Long Island uh, to um, North Suffolk Cardiology Group uh, to work at uh, SUNY Stony Brook, um, academic, big-powered position there, um, and ended up at the coast blissfully. Best, best decision I ever made. And I remember 
uh, my wife seeing an article in the Wilmington Star News at the time, and this is back, because you've been here 1996, seven? Um, four. Four. Yeah. Wow, it is longer than I thought it was. Uh, saw an article in the paper that Wilmington Health Associates welcomes Dr. Damian Brzezinski. And we looked at each other and we said, there's only one Damian Brzezinski. <laughs> Sadly. <laughs> so we called up and we hooked up again, and it has been 25 years of, of, of being together again, like that four years at King's College. And the funny thing was, you the first one to call me again after so long by my college nickname, which was JJ, mm -hmm. which I went by at school. Uh, what do you remember about King's College. I want to get into King's because I'm hoping that a lot of people at King's listen to this because I know there are a lot who follow you and a lot of our friends on social media. What do you remember about King's and going to school in downtown Wilkesbury? Um, King's to me, for a kid who had a lot of ambition and a lot of um, soul searching to do as to what I was what I was going to be in life, was really a kid in a candy shop. I mean, there was all of this opportunity. Um, there was an electron microscope that nobody was using. Um, there, you didn't even know this, did you? No, I didn't. I had no idea. <laughs> there, right next, right near our lunch, that lunch area. Yeah. Um, there was an electron microscope in the back science area that literally no one used. Uh, there was a mass spectrometer that nobody used. Wow. And and I sort of wandered on in this and said. I want to do electron mic microscopy. And they would hand me the, the, the textbooks and say, if you can learn it, you can do it. So I published my first couple of papers on electron microscopy. I learned mass spectrometry after that, taught myself, um, cu published a couple of papers in mass spectrometry, uh, ended up at the Department of Defense um, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, the summer of my sophomore year wow. on the basis of that stuff. You did a lot more than I thought you did. I used to only see you on Friday and Saturday nights hanging out at the cool places. Let, let's not talk about Sadunas. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it was that. It was, it was for a kid who had all this ambition um, and not really direction. It was a place where you got to really try different things. And King's was just a perfect fit for me because it was that. It was a real um, nice place where you could, um, you, could, you could fail. You could try things. You could not be so good at them. You know, it wasn't such a tight career track to medicine that if I got to be in, you know, organic chemistry too, that my career was over. Mm -hmm. It was really a matter of, well, let's try this and let's try this. I thought I was going to be in physical chemistry for a while. thought I was going to double major in physics for a while. Ended up with double majors in bio and chemistry and a minor in math. And, and, um, and fortunately had an, um, had an aptitude for uh, standardized tests and so, um, and was well trained at King's. They really prepped you on the medical college admission test and, um, Scored a pretty darn high score on the medical college admissions yeah, test. I would I wouldn't expect anything less from yeah, you. I, it would yeah got you know if you're blessed with something I guess get being blessed with a sta the ability to take a standardized test is not a bad one and at that point the the world of opportunity opened courtesy of Kings. Yeah, I'm blessed with a big mouth and I've been able to write it for thirty some years. Exactly. So. Um, you went to up to the Northeast, but. What about Berkeley? What drew you? I know you were a musician and you like music, but here you're trying to follow maybe this track, and all of a sudden you decide, well, I want to go into one of the most prestigious music schools in the country. Um, it was housing. So, really? Yeah. I was headed up to Harvard, and I had no place to stay. And Tony DeMito, my kindergarten friend whose wedding I'm attending, mm -hmm. um, was living at Berkeley. And so I was at Harvard at uh, the Harvard Medi uh, Medical S Hospital Systems, uh, doing postdoctoral fellowship, doing training, uh, doing education, and living at Berkeley Music School. And, you know, the first part of it was kind of, wow, hey, this is pretty cool. And uh, it wasn't very long after that that, that it was, yeah, I want to take classes and I want to be a part of this. And I really felt strongly. And then, you know, Tony opened a, a studio, uh, which was the first 48-track all-digital studio. Um, uh, in Boston, and and it was busy, and it was fun, and it was interesting, and very intellectually stimulating because um, there was a lot going on there, and so um, so began my life balance challenge of of uh, doing my postdoctoral work at Harvard, um, spending most of my time at Berkeley Music School, um, learning both, and and trying to figure out how they both fit. Who did you meet there that? you carry on relationships with now? Obviously, Tony is one, but you had to come across talented musicians along the way. Um, 
uh, of the longstanding relationships ha have mostly been secondary where a Berkeley cat would introduce me to somebody who'd introduce me to somebody who'd introduce me to a friend like Edwin McCain or would introduce me to someone like Ken Block from Sister Hazel right. or who would introduce me to um, um, Carl Carter from um, Maynard Ferguson's band. And, and those relationships then stuck. And, and the relationships sort of came and went and came and went. And kind of like any, I guess, networking, for lack of a better term, um, it ended up being sort of a, a random series of events that got me to a place where um, I was in the middle of the music industry. And it was um, very interesting being both a do doctor and a musician. Did it ever tempt you to give up the medical side to get into music full time at that part? Um, about eight classes in, I, you know, I, the answer is yes. I, uh, my, my intent was actually to um, leave medical school and become a full-time musician. And then I started um, attending music theory and watching seven. And this is, this, as you recall, this is in the 80s where guitarists right. were not guitarists. They were shredders. Right. And, and watching 16- and 17-year-old prodigies who just could do things on a guitar I could never imagine in my, my best years. And I realized that, yeah, no, maybe my niche isn't being on, on the front playing, you know, the, the 16th arpeggio here, the, just not my style. And so it was just a matter of finding my niche in music because I knew I enjoyed it. I knew, that, I knew that there was a role for me there somewhere. Um, and then it was just a matter of finding what that niche was, but now nah, having my doors blown in by enough 16 year old guitarists. The funny part about it is when I look back, you know, um, of the guys who were my friends, who absolutely just, just annihilated me, uh, as far as <laughs> musically, you know, uh, Tony Gaunt went on to this incredibly successful career with Mike Post, Oscars, Grammys, everything. Mike Post of Hill Street Blues Hill fame Street Blues, and then um, everything else. Massive, yeah. yeah, massive yeah. organization that virtually score, scores virtually every movie and television show you've ever watched. Uh, from there, um, uh, uh, Dan Rothschild. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, Dan, Dan was Tony's roommate. And so Dan was a really unassuming kid. A uh, really great guy, and uh, we couldn't understand why Dan had the best equipment on the planet until his father came in one day, who was Paul Rothschild, <laughs> yeah. the producer of The Doors and Janis Joplin yeah. albums. And we're looking at Dan and saying, you didn't mention your dad produced all The Doors and Janis. He's like, oh, yeah, nobody asked. And so, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> and so Dan went on to a career with Tonic, uh, with Better Than Ezra. Uh, went from there. He now is a bassist for Heart. He's been in the rock and roll. Technically, he's been in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame twice. Wow. And so so when I got my doors blown in, you know, looking yeah. back 30, 20, 25, 30 years later, I got my doors blown in by some pretty high quality yeah. people. So um, they found their niche. I found mine. I think everybody was all the, all the well. So you start to take the, music, or the uh, med medicine track. Do you remember when the first time it was that you saved somebody's life and what that felt like? Wow. Um, first time. There, there's two different versions of that. Okay. And that's why I hesitate. I apologize. Okay. The first time I ran a successful code was at Harvard. And it was a thrill because it was my first code. And um, I had just come out of the research lab because I was doing what was, called, uh, what was lovingly at Harvard called the hemidoc, which meant you spent half your year doing research and half your year doing clinical. And it was a, a program that was designed for researching physicians. Uh, and I had literally left the lab, started clinical that next day, and I was in charge of the first code of the morning. And I took a big deep breath, and we ran the code. And which for, means you're oh, literally. I, I apologize. Yeah, the, no. pa the patient had had a, what's called a code blue, full cardiac arrest. Um, I had a team there, uh, interns and residents and everybody. Um, we did things like defibrillation and administering drugs to someone who did not have a heartbeat, and they came back. And so that part was terrific. Um, the second one that immediately comes to mind was uh, a little more subtle. And so it was my first uh, day as an uh, intern at Harvard. And um, I met a young man who clearly had a um, severe chronic illness that needed treatment. Um, back then, HIV was a, a very taboo conversation right. and not something that happened. Um, but I felt really strongly that 
if I could convince this kid, who was about my age at the time, that if we got treatment, um, he didn't have to die from this. And um, lo and behold, um, he, he was HIV positive. He did take the test. Um, we did get him treatment, and he still sends me letter, thank you letters once a year, every year. That's you can't explain the joy in something like that, though, can you? It's that their medicine is so nuanced and so subtle. It's an art, and to me, um, uh, medicine is and always has been and always will be an art. Um, it's got a lot of science to it, and that science is an applied science, and it's, it it applies generally well eighty percent of the time. Uh, but in the end, medicine is about interpersonal relationships. It's about the fact. It's about gaining trust. It's about the fact that as a doctor, you're given something very precious, which is very, very confidential and sacred information about a, another human being. And they expect you to take care of that. And they expect you to um, treat them uh, appropriately. They expect you to not have any hidden agendas. And they expect you to do the best that you possibly can to get them better. Um, and there's that's an art. And to me, um, whether it's right brain versus left brain, it it's not really that far from the other art that I do. Mm. And and to me, that part I think is sometimes lost. The subtlety of, as you call it, I, I don't really call it this, but the subtlety of saving people's lives. Mm. Um, well, can, that's a lay person's description, yeah, obviously. Yeah. Right. The, the subtlety of, of helping someone get better is the way I look at it. Sure. Um, can be as simple simple as gaining enough trust to answer, answer, ask a simple question and get a very profound answer. And that happened this morning. I'll not betray, betray any patient trust, but it happened this morning before I got here. And it was really a matter of a patient who had trusted me above and beyond anybody else to tell me about an addiction that was being hidden above and beyond anything that they were so ashamed of that they were hiding. And now they're getting help. And, and to me, that's... That's the joy of medicine. Is medicine better now than it was when you first got in it 25, 30 years ago? I know it's changed an awful lot. It's changed. As you know, I, so I had a, a major medical issue in 2013. I was going to ask you about that a little bit later, but yeah. go ahead. But, but so medicine changed a couple of times for me. And so early on, um, you know, being the hot shot young Harvard doctor was one animal. A um, lot of fun, very interesting, very intellectually stimulating, very high paced, very little sleep, um, right. uh, and really enjoyable. Um, middle of my career, uh, Wilmington Health um, was really fun because I think this community kind of took both of us in as one of their own, and really we became such such a part of a community that didn't have to take us in with with all of its heart like it did, and so being. Being public property in Wilmington, in Wilmington, North Carolina, to me was an honor. That part was really, really the best part of being a doctor in Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, now we can talk about the health issues, but but after that I retired um, and uh, I have a little retirement practice called Island Cardiology. With a logo that looks like Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon, you not might ironic. Have seen it on the billboards, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I have a little little retirement practice called Island Cardiology. And now I do, I'm, I'm really back to the art of medicine again. And I really, I do enjoy that thoroughly. I enjoy that, the time to take that interpersonal relationship. Um, I, I, I enjoy the ability to get to know patients better. I, I enjoy being, having the luxury, which most doctors don't anymore, um, to say, no, why can't we do it this way? You know, I, I, I hear what, where, where the market forces are telling me this needs to happen, but that's not in the best interest of this person, so why don't we do it another way? You treated my father. You assisted in my father's treatment and my father's care. Uh, and my dad was a small-town doctor. You got to know him. He was one that when, you know, he would set your broken arm, he would deliver your child, he would take out your appendix, he would do anything. A town of 2,500 people like the one you grew up in, that's how doctors worked at that time. He was paid in food. He was paid in, in, in alcohol and, and bottles of wine sometime when things got really bad. Would you have been a good doctor back then? Oh, I don't know. Your dad was the best. I, I, would have never, I couldn't have shined your dad's shoes. But, he was but I'm saying you, you enjoy the personal care of patients. Oh, yeah. 
And so I think it really was in, in my dad's time, and, and this is not a knock on any physician now, because I know many of them and, and, and like many of them, but it was more of a calling back then exactly than it was a job, word. right? It's that. And, and, and I don't know, better would not be the term I'd probably hit on. I, I think I would have enjoyed it thoroughly. I, I think I would have enjoyed being that kind of doctor. Um, I, I do. I I. I with my heart, believe that medicine is a calling. I still do. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is extremely important. And um, just like your dad, I think that there is um, a philosophy or a culture behind thinking that medicine is a calling, that thinking that there is an art to medicine, that, that every patient is different and needs to be treated as such individually. Might take a little more time. Um, and, and to me, those things are kind of top of my priority list when, when we're treating people. So um, I, I certainly would have enjoyed it. Whether I've been good at it or not remains to be shown because your dad was such a great doctor. Well, but, but uh, again, I, I believe you really are top notch when it comes to the relationships of healthcare, And that's what you've always shown me in the decades we've known each other. But your health scare, how much did it scare you in 2013? Oh that my. day in your office. So you've heard the story. So, I have. Yeah, I was sitting in my office and woke up face down, face down on the floor, and um, went over to the emergency room and uh, uh, found out I had had a very large blood clot in my lungs called a pulmonary embolus. Um, it is called a submassive clot, and um, and um, knowing it, kn knowing my statistics, it had a a uh, 73% uh, fatality rate. Um, so it was a big deal. Um, and then right on the heels of that, um, we kind of got me out of the woods for that. And then I found out I had a cardiomyopathy. Um, lots of testing in between. Uh, and it was never clear what the relationship of the, the cardiac disease was to the blood clot in the lung because one should have been right side and one should have been left side, but somehow they seemed to have intermingled. Um, went up to Duke for the full nine yards, and Tom Bayshore, who I still think is arguably the greatest cardiologist on the planet, said, Damien, you're my friend. I have no idea what's going on here. I'm like, oh, wow, this is going That's well. Nice. That's <laughs> nice to hear. Yeah. As a friend, you're yes. the best man you can go to says, I haven't the vaguest clue of how this happened. But it happened. Yeah. And so, um, and then and then I just got very sick. And, and uh, coupled with the fact that uh, Prudence would have had me just flat out retire at that point and call it a day. But uh, uh being being the coal miner, you know, if the oh, arm yeah, if yep. the arm doesn't fall off, you're going going yep. back to the coal mines. You're right. You know, I was going to gut it out with a cardiomyopathy and a, and uh, ultimately a pacemaker, a biventricular pacemaker, um, and defibrillator and and make a go. But in the end, the best thing I could have done was get out of the very very high stress, very very high risk area, which I was doing interventional cardiology. You know, two a.m. four a.m. Sure. stenting. Of heart attacks, and it was it was it was it was a wise move. Um, um, I'd like to think I did it gracefully. I think I I, I know that I could have oh, done it more gracefully. But the thing of it is, is it really changed you? I mean, you still have the personality, and you still have the work ethic. But did it change your mental outlook on life, on family, on kids, on things like that? Yeah. So what happened was I had a recuperation time, and and everyone in my life knew that if I went back to the schedule that, 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 that I was wanting to go back to, that, that, that my funeral would be forthcoming. And, and uh, the wonderful people in my life, yourself and my wife and my kids, all said, we're, not, we're just not going to have it. You're, you're not going to do this. You're mm -hmm. not, you know, you are to be here longer than that. And, and that really gives you pause when the people in your life say, no, stop. You're stopping now. Um, it forces you to slam on the brakes and go, okay, well. And to somebody that's not used to that, that had to be some kind of a shock to you. A bit of whiplash, you know, when you're going yeah. Mach 3 and you hit the brakes to zero in milliseconds, it, uh, it's a bit of whiplash. But it was a lot of long, quiet walks on the beach, kind of sorting things out and going, okay, well, that part of my life is over. Mm -hmm. um, what does the next part of my life look like? Tell me the story, because I have heard it before, but I want people to, to hear about 
how the, the first of your nonprofits, which was Chords for a Cause, came about. And for those who don't know, these were concerts with high-profile acts who came in and played with the Wilmington Symphony, and it benefited organizations in southeastern North Carolina. But it's a funny story how that whole thing started and then how you kind of took the bull uh, by the horns and ran with it. Sure. So um, the way that ran was that uh, I was chairman of the Heart Ball here. 2009. Actually, you were, you were in attendance, right. as I recall. Um, a dear friend of mine, Edwin McCain, singer-songwriter from South Carolina, uh, has a couple of hits everybody knows, right. um, was gracious and agreed to play the Heartball that year. We all had a really wonderful time. Um, we were out back drinking Red Bull, because that was Edwin's drink of choice at that point, and up saunters a mutual friend of ours by the name of Billy Sappho, who happens to be a, <laughs> the mayor of Wilmington, North Carolina. Right. And... Bill was just thrilled about how this whole thing said. He said, we should do this every year. He said, in fact, we should like get the symphony behind you, Edwin, and we should do some type of event every year and do this. And, and uh, Edwin said, well, if you get the symphony, I'll do the show. And then I said, well, Billy, if Edwin does the show and you get the symphony, I'll pull together the nonprofit organization and we'll raise money for the children's hospital. Um, it, and it was a lovely conversation. It sounded great. And, and you know, we, as, as you know, you and I have many of these sure. conversations. Yeah, we've had those and, and, and solved problems worldwide <laughs> at 2 o'clock in the morning. World hunger has been yes. solved that way many times over. <laughs> we have. But it was funny. So less than two weeks later, uh, I am in um, uh, Bill Sappho's office uh, with uh, Reed Wallace, the wonderful head of the w Wilmington Symphony Orchestra. Um, and, and, and Bill Sappho is just going on as loquaciously as w Bill Sappho can do, saying, this is such a great idea, and we're going to do this, and Reed, you need to be a part of this. And Reed's just looking at us very quizzically and go, let me see if I got this right. You want to take my symphony, you want to put a pop star in front, and the cardiologist is going to run the whole thing. Right. And Bill Sappho's response is, exactly! Yeah, sure. <laughs> now you're seeing what we're selling here. <laughs> And so it took a little convincing. Reed, Reed, Reed was such a sport that from the beginning, just had no idea what he was getting himself into. None of us really did. Mm -hmm. um, but as you recall, we uh, did the first one at Keenan Auditorium, um, sold out the first show in eight and a half minutes, um, raised uh, a very healthy six-figure sum for charity, ended up uh, giving it to the Children's Hospital, helped um, uh, that one, as I recall. My memory's a little sketchy here, uh, but I believe that one helped fund a good chunk of the mobile pediatric right. intensive care unit. Yes. And so um, uh, one of the things that I haven't told any of you all, and only my wife knows, is that uh, it was a really good event. You were there, mm -hmm. um, really great music. It was really a lot of fun. And I kind of really got carried away by the moment and uh, um, got the honor of announcing everybody. And, and at that moment um, said, you know what? This is fantastic, everybody. I'm really excited. And we're going to do this for the next five years. Yeah. To which, as I walk off stage, my wife grabs me by the arm and said, what do you mean five years? This was a one-off. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, well. Let's bring in Sister Hazel. Hazel Let's bring in Gloriana. Gloriana Vanessa, Vanessa Carlton. Vanessa Carlton at the UNCW. Hazel. Yeah. yeah. Um, we had some fun with it. And it so it, it had a great run. Every show sold out. Um, ultimately, we raised a fairly healthy seven-figure sum for the community, and it was all grassroots. Everything came right back into Wilmington. No one ever took a salary. Um, so it was fun, and mm -hmm. it was a really great, uh, and it was my toe into how a nonprofit organization um, could help, and more importantly, how music brings people together in a constructive way to do a greater good. And now you have what's called Keep the Beat Alive, which has taken you literally on land and sea all over the place. Tell, talk about this a little bit, because you've, you've had the chance to rub elbows with some pretty cool individuals. Yeah. Well, I'm rubbing elbows with you, so that's... Well, I mean, that's, but, yeah, no. you know, outside of uh, South College Road and Shipyard Boulevard, that, that, <laughs> uh, that and a dollar will get you a cup of coffee. But you've taken this... Uh, defibrillator idea to some of the biggest bands in the world, and it's really caught on. Yeah, and so Keep the Beat Alive is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Uh, our mission statement is that we are dedicated to uh, eliminating cardiac death and touring professionals. So that's how that that that's what we are, and what we do very briefly is we um, install uh, first aid kits and um, 
uh, defibrillators in all the tour buses in America. Um, the American Heart Association has been wonderful in allowing us a little bit of leeway to travel <clears throat> to these tours and um, um, certify them in AED and CPR. And now this year in first aid, which is the first. Right. So we're very excited. That's about that. awesome about doing that too. And so we've been doing that uh, very aggressively this year. Um, and so it started. Um, it started a little inauspiciously. Right. With a with a a, a health scare of an individual that right here in town. Right here in town. So I was at uh, the then Ziggy's. Uh, and a friend of mine from the music industry, his, um, his name is Chris Musgrave. Mm -hmm. um, Chris uh, was originally with Death Row Records. Uh, Chris was in the car behind Tupac when he was shot. Yeah. Uh, Chris toured with Guns N' Roses. Chris toured with Sebastian Bach of Skid Row. Chris toured with every major band you could possibly think of on the planet. Um, and Chris was in town with a 90s band called Fuel that you and I both know and love. Um, and basically, Chris dropped over dead from a heart attack. Um, Chris uh, was resuscitated. We got him to New Hanover Regional Medical Center, um, at which time I got him prepared to go um, to the cath lab, to which he looked at me and said, uh, Damien, what are you what are you doing in scrubs? <laughs> so you weren't dressed that way five minutes ago, were you? Well, you know, I'd, I'd worked a lot in the music industry, and up and until then, literally that moment, I'd really kept the fact that I was a doctor away from the people that I worked in the music industry, because frankly, it, it hurts your credibility in, in music. Um, people assumed you were some type of dabbler or dilettante, um, just kind of hobbying this. And I didn't want to be a good musician for a doctor, and I didn't mm -hmm. want to be a good music producer for a doctor. I wanted to be a good music producer. Right. Um, and so I kind of kept it quite secret. And uh, um, I had to explain to Chris that, well, actually, we had never discussed my day job, but I'm an interventional cardiologist at New Hanover Regional Medical Center. And, well, frankly, you're having a heart attack. And he said, well, I know that. This is my third, and I understand that. And he was about 42 at the time. Oof. Um, wow. And so um, hilarity and a few four-letter words ensued between back and forth between the two of us. Um, we basically both agreed that I was going to give him enough sedation that he would sleep through the rest <laughs> of the day. And uh, he ended up with three stents that day. Um, and so he did well. Um, we um, got him. Uh, we got him to the intensive care unit. Uh, we got him better. Um, he stayed with us um, at our place. Susie took him in. My wonderful wife took him in as the den mother she is, and uh, we recuperated. And at that time, he started explaining to me that this type of cardiac issue was epidemic in the touring industry. Um, I was skeptical. I was. I was really. You know, this sounded like someone who had had a scare and was generalizing. And it took him to do some convincing of me that, that this was something that, that was somebody's life work. It, it sounded more like a blip on a, on a chart. And then he started pulling insurance data. And we started to realize that this was an epidemic in, in, in the music industry and that it was costing the music industry upwards of 100 to $200 million annualized wow. with boss tours. Um, if you just, t I can think of two tours just out, if you could just knock out two tours that happened where one key member had a heart attack and died, um, you were looking at a couple of hundred million dollars in canceled revenue for 18 months. And so it was, it was greatly impacting the industry. And so he convinced me. And so we founded our next 501c3 nonprofit called Chords for a Cause. And um, at first we weren't really sure what we were going to do because we knew that it was something, but the worst thing you want to do as a doctor is to walk into a bunch of rock stars and say, you know, we really st should stop smoking, drinking, and doing drugs. <laughs> You're not going to last in the room very long. Yeah, really? And so we really, we spent a lot of time carefully thinking, okay, how are we getting this message out? And so we went to a bunch of the major touring um, conferences, uh, NAM and TourLink and all of the big conferences that people in the industry know well, and we talked to people, and we tried to explain to them what we were trying to do. And we realized that telling people to live different lifestyles was not on the agenda. Um, so we came across the idea of why don't we just take um, AEDs, which are automatic what? external defibrillators. The portable ones, the right? The portable ones, the yeah. ones you see, you see in the airport mm -hmm. or the ones you see at the football stadium. And let's put them in every tour bus in America. And so we um, um, put in our first 100 AEDs in the first six months, and we used eight. Um, uh, as a comparison, we probably got a couple of hundred in this community, and a brief search of the data showed that over 10 years we used one. 
And so wow. it told you that this was a pretty alarming statistic. They're, 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 and can, needed and tremendously. Needed. And, and the canary in the coal mine was already singing right out of the gate. Um, and then, you know, and, and then it became um, uh, very striking. Then, then everyone was reading the headlines of one person in music or another having a cardiac event or passing away or, or all of it. And then it just became a flood. And so we went um, from kind of this little engine that could and, and knocking on doors and people wondering why we were there in the first place to uh, fast forward to 2019. And I opened up my 2019 calendar January 1st, and we are booked solid for the year. We did that in three days. And so we are booked with everybody from Kenny Chesney, Def Leppard, um, Journey, Kiss, um, we were on <laughs> Shiprocked with yeah. That was a, I saw the, I saw the social post on that one. That oh, looked that, like a blast. That was fun. It was interesting. Uh, Danny Hill, who is a dear friend of mine, all the way back uh, again, talking about connections. So Danny was Vanessa Carlton's tour manager during our Chords for a Cause years, mm -hmm. and Danny and I have kept in touch ever since uh, for both health health reasons and because we're friends. Um, and Danny and I, um, uh, Danny had uh, helped create Shiprocked, which was a um, uh, a carnival cruise ship with the top bands in the world on it for seven days. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> and how many times might an AED be needed on something like that? Often. Yes. And and so this is our this is the tenth year of Shiprocked. Uh, we have been participatory just about from the beginning, and um, this year was uh, we we took a lead role um, in. Um, educating um, musicians and talent and staff about about the things that are going on, what they can do, uh, doing training sessions, uh, getting people ready for things like um, first aid and all of that stuff. Is there, and I've known you for as long as I've known you and, and the people you have been around and are friends with, you don't, you're not in awe easily. You don't get you know, uh, starlit eyes, very easy, starstruck. But was there an oh, wow moment when this thing took off that you just sat back and said, man, are we filling a niche here? Or you saw somebody that you know as a high-profile rock and roller who said, thank you, you may have saved my life. Both. So um, uh, it, it, it caught momentum insanely quickly. You, we put out the first 50 defibrillators and there were orders for hundreds more right behind it. Um, a couple of things happened quickly. Um, a couple of the bigger tours and the tour managers specifically saw the value of what was going on and they saw that value because they had already lost people on tour. Um, and so Faye McMahon from Def Leppard uh, became this enormous proponent um, and we were at a con I was at a conference speaking about this and going the data, and and he just got up and said, "You all need to listen. This is the future. People are dying, and we need to do something now." Um, literally after that meeting, um, my calendar was full. Right. Um, and so at that point, when the bigger tours were endorsing us and saying, "We can't start without this." Um, we flew out to Los Angeles to work with Lincoln Park, uh, the last Lincoln Park tour before Chester Pen Bennington passed. Um, and two things happened. Number one, we got there. And uh, Jim Digby, who is the head of uh, ESA, the Event Safety Alliance, is a wonderful, intelligent, thoughtful man. And people were just kind of sitting around. And I was looking and going, Jim, what's everybody doing? They said, they're waiting for you. Get to work. And it dawned on me at that point, there were points at at as it is going on now, including Shiprock, where this tour wasn't going to start without these people being certified with CPR and AED and first aid. And we now became an integral part of things don't start until we do our job. And that, that took it up to a different serious level. Sure, I can imagine so, yeah. Um, and then on that same tour, something happened that really, really ran, ran things home for me. And um, I told this to Susie this week. If, if if only this happened in all of the work we did, it was worthwhile. Um, so Paul White, who's a really dear friend, uh, who went from the um, Lincoln Park tour to the Metallica tour, um, was in, at Lincoln Park when we were training. And, and Paul will tell the story better than I will. We might, we might get him on one day. Um, and Paul didn't want to be there. Paul had a million better things to do to listen to some dumb doctor from North Carolina <laughs> talk about CPR. Right. Um, and he did everything he could in that classroom to ignore me as best he could. Um, 
and so we uh, uh, we met again a um, couple of months later on the Sting and Peter Gabriel tour, and Paul just gave me this big hug, and he said, you'll never guess what happened. And I'm like, all right, I'll bite, what? And so I'll make the story very brief, but he was actually out um, on a beach, uh, walking the beach um, with some of his family, and there was a young lady lying on the ground and two guys who were attempting CPR. Wow. And it was going horribly. And this was no less than two weeks after he and I had trained together. And he said, he said, out of his mouth came, that's not how Dr. Brzezinski taught me how to do CPR. Um, the mother of this child went and grabbed him and said, you sound like you know what you're doing. Please, please, please help my daughter. He said the most amazing things happened. He said, I really tried to ignore you. He said, everything you taught me, every slide, everything that went in kicked into gear. And he said, I started doing CPR on this young lady. He said, and we continued CPR. Uh, I recruited the other guy who didn't know what he was doing and, and got him to do the mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. We continued CPR. The ambulance arrived, um, shocked her twice, and she was doing fine. And wow. he, gave, he gave me a hug. He said, you know, um, other than my kids' births, he said, nothing I've ever done in my life is cooler and more important than that. And I thought, okay, That's, this worked. Yeah. This was this – was, if nothing else happened in our lives, that one was worth it. Wow. Um, that Good one was stuff. Fun. It was. It was. And the rock star moment, if I could – Sure, yeah. I want to know this. I want to know this Everybody one. wants to yeah. know the rock – as you know, I, I, I really strive – to try to make sure that every um, everyone is treated equal. It doesn't matter, mm-hmm. you know, whether you're a coal miner like my grandparents are, or the president of the company. You know, it doesn't really matter what happens. Um, so we try to uh, keep people equal. So we were on said Sting and Peter Gabriel tour, and we were at lunch, and and uh, a British gentleman by the name of Peter Gabriel kind of saunters on up and says, you want to explain to me this AED you're putting in my tour bus? And I'm like, yeah, I do, I do. So we had a brief conversation, and it was, uh, he was very inquisitive and instructive, and he looked at me and he said, um, I was in a, a little brief aside, it was at uh, the uh, Columbus, Ohio hockey rink where the Columbus right. Blue Jacks. Okay. So yeah. this was their rehearsal hall, and everything was set up, mm-hmm. uh, but they were rehearsing there for a week. And uh, he looked at me and he said, um, Sting and I are going to go jam on stage now. Do you want to come watch us? Oh, wow. And I said, yes. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> so literally, this is an entire empty hall and Sting and Peter Gabriel and a couple of musicians get out and into the microphone. You hear, you want to hit us some stones? And I'm like, yes. That yes, would be I nice. Do. Yes. And um, it was all I could do to take a, out my phone and videotape, which would have gotten me bounced for life from right. this entire tour. Um, but it was it was fun because it was one of those moments to literally step back and say, yeah, there's some pretty cool perks to this gig, let me yeah. tell you. And so it was fun, but it was fun because it wasn't a – there was a reason behind it. There there was a sense that there was something that we were doing that was integral to it. Yeah, you weren't we just – you didn't just pop down two or three grand just to have the opportunity. You it, were doing this – it Genuinely, yes. It wasn't a mean grade. I, I yeah. think a lot, and it's funny, I think a lot of musicians, we, we get invites all the time. We pass on most of them. Uh, it, it's funny. I think it's it, it's significant only in that. I think it for many of the people that I work with, especially the musicians, it's their way of saying thanks back. Listen, you know, you're doing something that, that's helpful to us, very helpful. You've saved this person's life on our tour. Um, you know, this is what we can do to say thank you. And it's cool. How important is it to you? I, I know the first couple of years here, you really concentrated on work. And then you started to become a little more seen in this community and started to do some of the nonprofit and started to serve on some boards. Now that you're mid-50s and have been here for a quarter of a century, how important is it for you to be a leader in this community? I don't know about leader. Um, I really think that this community, for both of us, took us in at a time when um, they didn't have to, and they were so gracious about it. And we just kind of became public property here. And and people came up to you in restaurants and in bars and, and, you know, on the sidewalk, and they were friendly and they were courteous, and you helped my grandmother, and that was really great. And at some point, there was such goodwill through all of it. You, 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 you feel like you have, and let me rephrase that, you want to give back. 
you want to you want to be able to say thank you in your way and and being a doctor is a great way of doing it don't get me wrong but you get compensated for that you know that's it, it's great to be a doctor it's really a lot of fun that's a cool gig um but it's really a matter of no nah, i want to say thank you to you guys in a way that you know it's from from the heart that i'm doing this without any any personal benefit um i'm going to take my time to do this um and and I'm this is my way of saying thank you, and and this community is such uh, we we all know this yes. community is such an amazing community, and there's so many great people like yourself, um, Billy Sappho, Jonathan Barfield, people who just give and give and give and give and give, and 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 those people um, are the people that a I want to be more like, and as you know I have four boys. And I want to point to my boys and go, no, that's who you want to be like. These are the people, these are the word you use. These are leaders. These are people who lead a community to someplace better. Um, and they do it by being very selfless. And, and their first question always is, well, what can I do to help? Right. And that's the important thing. Uh, I want to talk about another thing that you and I have in common is that we both married people who have made us a whole lot better in life. Uh, and I have told this and I have said this and people listening to this podcast are probably sick and tired of me saying it, that I married a saint and I got way out over my skis and was lucky that she said yes to me 34 and a half years ago. How much does Susie mean to you, your success professionally, your success personally as a father, as a husband? And we're doing this on Valentine's Day to preface that. Oh, yes, that. yes. Oh, I must yes. say that th this will be heard later, but we are doing this on Valentine's Day. You're right. <laughs> um, Susie's everything. And to me, it's sort of that. Um, she is an amazing grounding force. And she is literally in our family. She is just uh, unqualified love. She is unconditional with the way she loves our family, our kids, and me, and her mother. And, and she is the most giving, caring, hardworking person you'll ever meet. Um, she's the best nurse I've ever had. Um, still runs my little retirement practice now. Um, and then turns right back around and becomes this amazing wife and mom and daughter to uh, a, a mom, her mom, who has very profound dementia, who lives with us now. And she is 24-7, 365 just the most giving person and and you and i get to be sort of the out there guys and mm -hmm. we get yes. to be mocked to um you with your hair on fire me my, my hair already burned off <laughs> yeah you um, you took the easy way out of, of I, shaving I, your head I which i told you many out. times i wish i could do oh you should try it um and and we can be that because with us is a very grounded wonderful wife who is there to make sure that all of the other details are tended to. And so it's easy for us to be at a charity gig on a Friday night um, because our wives are making sure the kids are okay and the house is okay and the dogs, if the dog's puking, that's getting taken care of and the mother-in-law is doing fine. And and those are so underappreciated traits. And and my wife and your wife, who I've known since college because right. she was another classmate, right. um, um, uh, they have it in spades. They, they're, it's what they do best. It's, it's their caring and their giving and their, their moms and their wives, and they're just fantastic at what they do. Unfortunately, the last couple of minutes of my interview with Damian Brzezinski did not record some kind of mechanical snafu. What you missed was me telling Damian how much I value his trusted friendship for these three plus decades, and how lucky we all are now that he calls Southeastern North Carolina home. You can check out Damien's travels and his work to keep the music industry healthier. The website is keepthebeatalive.org. His medical practice website, islandcardiology.net. You can find both of those accounts on Instagram and Facebook, along with Damien Brzezinski himself. And before we go, I'd like to ask you once again to please rate and review our podcast. I really would like to know what you think about the work we're doing. The more ratings and reviews we get, the higher we'll be listed on the podcast apps and the better chance we'll have of bringing in new listeners. I'm John Evans. Thanks so much for joining us for this week's episode of One on One.